All right, y'all, uh, welcome back. Uh, we are looking at the handout that is posted on Moodle, and I've just got it up on my screen here. Um, and uh, this is uh, our kind of uh, secondary reading, if you will, um, for this week. Um, uh, there's These are ancient uh, uh, wisdom literature texts that I've put together, and uh, I'm gonna ask you in the forums to engage um, with, uh, with to pick one of these in particular um, to engage on. But let me just uh, mention a couple of these. So uh, the Maxims of Tahotep. So this is a, an Egyptian uh, text from about 2000 BC, uh, and Maxims or wisdom or teachings or counsel or instruction, all these different words get used for this text of Tahotep. Um, so let's just start to read this together and let's just see. So I'm going to start up here, uh, this first line here. Written teachings of the overseer of the city. If you all see, I'm just up here with Maxims of Tahotep. Written teachings of the overseer of the city, the vizier Tahotep. So uh, Ptahotep is not a king, not a pharaoh. Uh, he's a vizier, uh, some sort of official, and he's uh, over a city. He's a city official uh, and maybe the governor of a city or mayor of a city, I guess. Under the majesty of Pharaoh Izazi, king of upper and lower Egypt, may he live forever and ever. Good thing to say about a king that, that you work for, right? Um, but uh, anyway, so that, that's the title of this thing, right? The name of the text is written teachers by the overseer of the city of Vizier of Tahotep. And then the overseer of the city, the vizier, vizier Tahotep, he says, so these are all words of this teacher, this vizier, right? And then it starts, beginning of the maxims of good discourse, spoken by the prince, count, God's father, beloved of God, eldest son of the king of his body, overseer of the city, vizier Tahotep, teaching the ignorant in knowledge and in the standard of good discourse, beneficial to him who hears, but woe to him who neglects it. Uh, if you take a look at Proverbs chapter one, uh, you're gonna see it starts really in a very similar way beginning of the maxims of good discourse spoken by the prince count god's father beloved of god eldest son of the king of his body overseer of the so it's the beginnings of the maxims of good discourse these teachings um, of how to live your life well in good discourse uh, so this, that's what this is this is kind of like the the subtitle of the book right uh, this is it, it's supposed to teach you how to do stuff well and then it's by this guy who's awesome right uh god's father beloved of god eldest son of the king of his body so uh, so the vizier of Tahotep is not just some random guy, right? Uh, yeah, he's uh, um, uh, eldest son of the king of his body. Um, he is uh, he's a he's a, an important um, member of the royal family, uh, teaching the ignorant in knowledge. This is what the book is supposed to do, and in the standard of good discourse. So, being part of the, uh, of this kind of discourse of of wisdom, beneficial to him who hears, but woe to him who neglects it. So it's actually bad it's bad too bad things happen if you don't pay attention to this discourse of wisdom but if you do if you pay attention it's good uh if you are a man who and then we kind of move on there's there's some other stuff that comes after that but we're going to skip to this part if you are a man who leads charged to direct the affairs of a great number seek out every well-adjusted deed so that your conduct may be blameless so uh, if you're this is this is what it's directed towards uh, this book is written so that you can learn how to be a really good leader um, and it's supposed to uh, uh, help you direct lots of other people to, um, so that your conduct may be blameless, so that you don't get in trouble with, with the Pharaoh, right, for being a bad manager, uh, which could get you into big trouble, in fact. And then, great is Ma'at, lasting in effect. Notice, remember, Ma'at, the goddess of wisdom, right? And it's important, right? Ma'at is going to change your life if you pay attention to her undisturbed since the time of Osiris. Remember, Ma'at was like kind of curled up in that little ball, right? She's uh, undisturbed since the time of Osiris. She's sitting there like thinking her big thoughts and holding the universe together. Um, so, uh, one punishes the transgressor of laws, though the heart that robs overlooks this. It's kind of an ancient proverb, right? You punish the transgressor of laws, though the heart that robs overlooks this. Um, uh, someone who's robbing, remember heart, mind, uh, the person who's, uh, who's a robber doesn't even think about the fact that they're transgressing the laws while they're doing it, right? Baseness may seize riches, yet crime never lands its wares. So uh, you actually might get your hands on some riches, right? If you end up trying to steal things, but mm, you don't actually get what you really want. You never land your wares, right? Uh, Maybe temporary kind of gain of riches, but in the end, you're gonna you're gonna face some consequences for it. Now, why would you why would you tell uh, a vizier this? Why would you tell someone training to be a part of the royal family or part of the uh, bureaucratic institution this, the administration? Well, it's because you have a lot of temptations to take and steal stuff. If you are in charge of a city. 
There's endless possibilities for you to grift. You might get riches, but you're not going to land your wares. You're going to die. You're going to get executed by the king, right? Don't do it. Um, he says, that is the person who wants to steal stuff, I acquire for myself. He does not say, I acquire for my function. So someone who's not wise says, I acquire from a function means I acquire like I'm doing my job, right? I'm, I'm acquiring things for my uh, position, for my city, uh, for the good of the people around here. No, I'm acquiring for myself. In the end, it is ma'at that lasts. And the man says, that's eh, my father's domain. So uh, this, uh, uh, in the end, ma'at survives, right? And uh, in the end, you realize that someone else is actually in charge. <laughs> you realize you're not in charge in the end. It's ma'at, but also your dad, the, the, uh, your symbolic father, the pharaoh, who's going to come and take. It's his domain, not yours. You're going to pay for it. When wealth has come, follow your heart. Wealth does no good if one is annoyed. So when you do, if you do end up getting rich, yeah, have fun. Have fun. Enjoy it. Like, don't just sit there and, and fuss about it. Or, uh, you know, we all know people who have a lot of money or seen movies of people who have a lot of money or, or, you know, reality shows, and they seem like consumed with petty stuff. They don't really enjoy their wealth, you know. Um, wealth does no good if one is annoyed. Yeah. I mean, people, I, I can't tell you how many, like, whenever I see reality shows and people as like, lives are consumed with, like, petty nonsense. Um, yeah. This would be good advice for them, right? Uh, or for a vizier. Um, if you are in a court of justice, stand or sit as fits your rank assigned to you on the first day. Sounds a little bit like Jesus. Uh, you know, don't don't try to grab uh, a, a chair that you aren't, you know, that you, you shouldn't be having. Um, so in other words, like pay attention when you walk into the court of law where you're supposed to sit and follow the instructions and don't like sit above your rank or try to like boast about all that stuff, right? Just sit where you're told to sit, right? So you can see that this, this maxims of Tahoktep, it's really trying to do these things, trying to get you to be a, a productive citizen, but also who thinks about the future and thinks about consequences, thinks about ma'at. The principle of wisdom. Let's take a look, quick look at the instruction of Kagemni, about 1900 BC. Uh, I can try to zoom in here and make this a little bit bigger. That might be helpful. Okay. Uh, so the humble man flourishes, and he who deals uprightly is praised. The innermost chamber is open to the man of silence. So you got to sit and meditate for a while if you want to know anything. If you want like the innermost chamber of like ma'at or whatever. But you got to you got to sit and think and reflect, right? A lot of people just kind of do all day all day long, but don't sit back and think. Also, the, that first bit, the humble man flourishes, right? Um, seek humility. Uh, wide is the seat of the man cautious of speech, but the knife is sharp against the one who forces a path that he advanced not save in due season. So wide is the seat of the man who is cautious of speech. Um, you got a lot of lee leeway, a lot of wiggle room. Uh, if you uh, are, are careful about your speech, if you don't promise things you can't deliver on, uh, if you don't uh, uh, give people praise you don't deserve it, right? If you're careful with your speech, um, this can help you in the long run. Uh, but also, uh, 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 you know, this next, this next bit, if you sit with a company of people, desire not the food, even if you want it. So, you know, don't, if, if you're sitting down at a feast, look at what's happening and offer the food to other people, be nice and polite. Uh, this also you can see in the book of Proverbs. Uh, it tells you how to sit and eat with a king. Um, it takes only a brief moment to restrain the heart and it is disgraceful to be greedy. So, you know, uh, if, if you're the son of a king, you might be tempted to just take whatever you want wherever you want, right? But no, show show respect uh, to everyone. If a man be lacking, I mean, and also you want, you want to show that you're prudent, right? That you have a lot, a lot of like, wisdom with you to make good decisions. Uh, uh, be, uh, if a man is lacking in good fellowship, no speech has any influence upon him. So you got to have good friends. I mean, we saw this in 1 Kings 12, right, with uh, Jeroboam uh, and uh, Rehoboam. Rehoboam had bad friends. It didn't help him at all, right? So if a man is lacking a good fellowship, no speech has any influence upon him. He is sa of sour of face to the glad-hearted who are kindly to him. He is a grief to his mother and his friends. We all know people like that, right? Uh, don't be that person. Uh, be not boastful of your strength in the midst of young soldiers. Beware of making strife. One not one knows not what may chance, what the God will do when it punishes. So any God here, right? Fill in the blank for a polytheistic people. Um, but uh, 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 you know, be, be cautious if you're running running around with soldiers. Um, don't don't talk about how you know much of a tough guy you are all the time because these are young soldiers. They might try to take you out. And lastly, the, for this, this paragraph here, the vizier has his children summoned after he gained a complete knowledge of the ways of humans. 
Wow, this guy, Kagemni. All right, no, so Kagemni's one getting the instructions. So the, the vizier, whoever this is who's writing this, um, has all his children summoned after he gained a complete knowledge of the ways of humans. That's pretty pretty bold, right? Their character having come upon him. And in the end, he said to them, so that the setting here is that all the children are gathered around the dying dad, and the dying dad is trying to pass on his last wisdom here. All that is written in this book, heed, as I, heed it as I said it. Do not go beyond what has been set down. This actually sounds, sounds a bit like the end of Ecclesiastes. But the whole point is that the kids are supposed to recite it aloud, what was written. They're supposed to read this thing over and over again. And then it was good in their hearts beyond anything in this entire land or more. It was, it was the best thing for them to read, right? Okay, so uh, so you can see a lot of these, um, uh, especially the Egyptian ones, they're set, situated in a family. I mean, the, the uh, Mesopotamian ones are in many places too. You can see that from Proverbs as well. And there's these kind of it's like a grab bag of different things you're supposed to do or not do that's going to help your life, right? So the instructions of Merikare, another Egyptian one, um, uh, curb the multitude, suppress its heat. You know, I mean, you know, if you're if you're uh, in office, uh, try to make sure that people don't get too uh, too crazy or foamed up about anything in particular. Um, you know, uh, try to keep people calm, and it will help you. Uh, copy your fathers, your ancestors. See their words and in books. Open, read them. Copy their knowledge. He who is taught becomes skilled. This is a little tip of the hat that this is about scribes and how to become a good scribe. Um, so a lot of this stuff was written for scribes and by scribes. Uh, so strengthen your borders, your frontier patrols. Some of this is like foreign policy advice, right? Um, and then uh, we can see the admonitions of Ipuwer, this next one. Um, uh, these are just a bunch of sayings like, uh, so uh, indeed many dead are buried in the river. The stream is a sepulcher and the place of embalmment has become a stream. Indeed, noblemen are in distress while the peasant is full of joy. This is a bit like something, something crazy has happened in the community and this person is responding um, to the crisis, the overturning of uh, power in this community. Um, indeed, noblemen are in distress while the peasant is full of joy. Every town says, let us suppress the powerful among us. So some of these um, instructions actually respond to very precise particular uh, circumstances um, uh, that, that where, where things have changed, right? There's, uh, there's been a crisis in the community. Um, uh, this one, uh, the instructions of uh, Dua Keti, uh, you should definitely uh, read this one. Um, this is uh, made by the man of Charu called Dua Keti for a son called Pepe. Uh, and there's a little story here, and you can see the story at the beginning, uh, and then it kind of follows up at the end um, of the story. I'll, I'll let you look at this one, but this is going to be about scribes. And uh, maybe, well, I'll, I'll just introduce this one for you, but you should definitely read it. This is a, this is a book, it might as well be called Why You Should Go to Seminary. Um, and what it is saying is it's this dad telling his son, definitely find a job where you get to read and talk most of the time. Because let me tell you what, I'll point this part out here. Look, no scribe will ever be lacking in food or the things of the house of the king. May he live, prosper, and be well. Thank God for the father and for your mother who are placed in the path of the living. Um, in other words, the, the dad's like, you, you don't want to like uh, uh, move stones for a living. That's really hard work and it's terrible. You should definitely study to be a scribe um, because even the worst of being a scribe, it's got its stresses and everything else, but um, yeah, you're, you're not going to break your hand uh, dropping a stone on it. <laughs> so anyway, okay. Uh, uh, there's a lot of other things I could point out here, but let's move on to the, some uh, these Sumerian ones. Here's the Sumerian Proverbs about old age. These are kind of funny. My urine used to flow in a strong torrent, but now you flee from my wind. <laughs> I don't think I have to explain that one, uh, but yeah, they can be funny. These are supposed to, some of these are supposed to be funny. Some of the proverbs in the Bible are supposed to be funny too. Um, so you know, don't don't miss a good joke. Um, uh, and then uh, instructions of Shurapak. Um, this is a, a, an important um, early one uh, uh, from Mesopotamia uh, that has just a bunch of comments. Stand aside from a quarrel. Cool. Refrain from getting into a quarrel. Hmm. That's these are right one right after the other. Or don't loiter about when there is a quarrel. Hmm. Or don't vouch for someone. Don't let someone vouch for you. The fact that these are kind of collected like this makes us think, as biblical scholars and ancient or Eastern scholars, we think that these things were collected not because someone said all these things in a row, but because they were collected like everything that you knew about vouching. We're going to put that in a little, a little column. And then everything about uh, quarrels. We're just going to gather all the stuff about quarrels together. So some of the stuff you see in Proverbs, there'll be like eight or nine Proverbs in a row that are all about something. And sometimes it's kind of a game for you to figure out like what's the link between all these things. Um, these random Proverbs that were created over many different places in time and points in history. Um, don't steal anything. Don't break into a house. After a thief is caught, he will be a slave. Don't commit robbery. Uh, you should not cut yourself with an axe. 
Whoa, that's crazy wisdom. Um, anyway, all to say, some of these you'll read like, well, okay, but uh, but it's also right. You shouldn't cut yourself with an axe. Don't do it. Um, okay, so what what I'm going to ask you all to do is to pick counsels of wisdom or instructions of Shuba Awilum or the instructions of Akikar, which is a really interesting one, uh, a Babylonian dialogue of pessimism. I'm going to end, but I'll tell you about this one because it's a little hard to interpret on your own. Um, but for, for these, pick either the instructions of Akikar, the instructions of Shuba Owilun, the counsels of wisdom, and let's do those. Let's, let's pick those three. Uh, pick one of those, read it, and um, and comment on something you find inside of it. That is, um, uh, what's something that you find in these that you could say, this really is wisdom? Where do you find wisdom in one of these ancient texts? Uh, and I'm going to end with, by pointing this out to you. Uh, the only real, like, uh, really developed joke um, that I found in the wisdom literature. There's like little jokes about, you know, grandpa's farting like above. Um, but here the Babylonian dialogue of pessimism. So this is a, a dialogue. There's a, a slave and his master. And the master is like an, an upper class elite person, right? Uh, and uh, the, 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 I got the two voices here, one voice, uh, and that's the master's voice is in regular print and the slave's voice is, is in italics. Okay, so it starts out, the master says, slave, listen to me. And the slave says, here I am, master, here I am. Quickly, fetch me water for my hands. I want to dine. And the, the, the slave always responds with proverbs. And that's, that is to say that slaves um, were understood to be, many, many of them, wise people. They would have been captured from the elite, um, from other societies, many of them. So that is to say that, uh, um, I mean, in, in ancient Rome, like the people who were the best engineers were all slaves. Uh, so that is, like, it has nothing to do with like a, a level of education reached, um, you know, slavery in the ancient world. Uh, some of the best warriors um, would have been enslaved because they were captured in battle from other, other places. So these people were often considered to be uh, people of valor or people who had lots of expertise and wisdom, um, but they still had to serve um, other people. So I'll say, uh, and I bring this up because, you know, uh, in American um, society uh, uh, of the uh, 17th through uh, uh, 19th century, um, there was a, a, an effort from uh, slaveholders in, in the United States and in the Americas before that uh, to suppress knowledge um, and suppress um, uh, many kinds of like a, a knowledge of skills um, from enslaved peoples. Uh, but in the ancient world, it was a very different practice. Um, uh, so slave, listen to me. Here I am, master, here I am. Quickly, fetch me water from my hands. I want to dine. Dine, master, dine. A good meal relaxes the mind. Now notice the slave is giving him a proverb. This is kind of like a, a, a learned thing. Uh, and then we have a little break here, this little bit here that um, that is in parentheses. Um, uh, we don't we don't know what that would have said, but it's a, it's a part of a broken tablet. Um, but so then the, something, the meal of his God. To wash one's hand passes the time. So he gives him a few proverbs like that back up like what this guy wanted to do anyway, right? So I want to eat. Great, a good meal relaxes the mind. Washing your hands passes the time, cool. And then the, the master says, oh well slave, I will not dine. Now this is the, the joke right here is that uh, uh, these people in control, uh, they, they don't ever know what they wanna do and they just, their, their whims change at a moment's notice and of course the servants are like, Oh God, these people, they can't make up their minds. They're gonna make me get to get dinner ready and they don't wanna eat the freaking dinner, right? Um, so, uh, oh well slave, I will not dine. And then so then the slave responds, do not dine master, do not dine. To eat only when one is hungry, to drink only when one is thirsty is best for man. What he means there is like he's giving him proverbs to back up what he wanted to do, right? Eating food isn't great right now. What this shows is that <clears throat> There's a proverb for all times, all places, right? You can always use a proverb to back up exactly what you already wanted to do. So it's a, it's a joke, right? you know, wisdom literature can be kind of abused and misused, right? To, to kind of, we see this happen all the time, statistics. People use statistics to tell them what they, to back up what they already wanted to do. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is the beginning of the joke. The joke gets funnier, right? So then slave, listen to me. Here I am, master, here I am. This is the second paragraph. Quickly, fetch me my chariot, I'm going to hunt. Okay, so the guy wants to go hunt. Drive, master, drive. A hunter gets his belly filled. The hunting dog will break the bones of the prey. The raven that scours the country can feed its, its nest. The fleeting onager finds rich pastures. So he's piling up proverb after proverb to back up what the master wanted to do. The master says, oh, well, slave, I will not hunt. So he just off the cuff decides not to do it, right? Do not go, master, do not go. The hunter's luck changes. The hunting dog's teeth will get broken. The raven that scours the country has a hole in its wall as a home. The fleeting onager has a desert as its stable. Um, so he's like parables and proverbs um, that he's telling to be like, don't, don't go hunting, it's gonna hurt you. And then the last one here. Slave, listen to me. Here I am, master, here I am. What then is good? 
to have my neck and yours broken or to be thrown in the river? Is that good? Um, this guy's like, I don't know, for some reason we don't know but from the joke here, but it's he's despairing of life. He's like, why don't we just go die? And then the slave responds, who is so tall as to ascend to heaven? Who is so broad as to encompass the entire world? Now, these sound like they could come right from the book of Job uh, or from Proverbs. In fact, uh, it's very wisdom literature-ish. Um, who is so tall as to ascend to heaven? Who is so broad as to encompass the entire world? You know, in any way, like, uh, I mean, wow, that's, you know, the, uh, um, uh, another way to, to say this is um, uh, I, I can't get up to heaven or uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know what's right or what's good. You know, he's responding to this guy saying, uh, why, why don't we die? <laughs> well, I, wow, I, that's, I don't know. It's a, it's a pretty tough question. And the guy says, oh, well, slave, I will kill you and send, your, send you first. So, the, you know, the, the slave kind of responds, yes, but my master would certainly not survive me for three days. And this is the joke is that uh, you know the, the the guy says, "Well, why don't we just die? What is life all about?" You know, it's kind of this ennui that some wealthy people actually get sometimes. Um, and uh, the slave is like, "Wow, that's a deep question." You know, he's kind of like you. At least I imagine that he's trying to like blow it off, like let's not do this. And the guy goes, "Hmm. Well, how about I send you first? And the slave responds, uh, "Yeah, if you get rid of me, you're not living three days because you don't know anything. You can't get anything done. You are the stupidest guy in the world, right? I mean, you know, the sense that like he can't wash his own hands, he can't get his own dinner ready, he can't. Yeah, let's see how long you last if you decide to get rid of me, right? As some sort of philosophical ex uh, exercise. And part of this is a joke too about these wise masters um, uh, who you know have all this access to to riches and wisdom and so on, but." Uh, um, can't even take care of themselves and also come up with stupid ideas like uh, throwing themselves off a bridge to see like what happens next, right? So all to say this literature, uh, this wisdom literature is supposed to be um, at turns uh, deep and insightful and um, uh, but also funny sometimes in this kind of strange humor, um, this kind of gallows humor that you get here, right? Um, uh, people in the ancient world had much much stranger senses of humor. I guess, I don't know, we all have different senses of humor. But all to say, people in the ancient world had some um, pretty uh, morbid senses of humor in part because life was actually short. That was a way that they dealt with um, the uh, insecurity of life uh, in the ancient world. Um, but so, in the comment, comments, uh, talk about either the instructions of Ahikar, the instructions of Shuba Uilun, or the counsels of wisdom, and tell me if you can find any wisdom that you want to share in there. And then for next time, uh, read the book of Proverbs and begin with this kind of background, uh, try to uh, uh, think through some of these uh, questions and comments. All right, uh, I look forward to engaging with you all in the comments. Thanks for hanging with me.